Hello and welcome to the Medjlis Podcast, Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty's current affairs talk show focusing on Central Asia. I'm Bruce Panier, host of the Medjlis and author of the weekly Central Asia and Focus newsletter. Our topic is recent violence in Central Asia's only two autonomous regions, Gornobadakshan in eastern Tajikistan and Karakal, Pakistan in western Uzbekistan. In both regions, government security forces initiated harsh crackdowns on the local populations after protests broke out. Authorities in the two countries say this was necessary to restore order. But there are numerous allegations of rights violations, and clearly the government narratives do not tell the whole story. To discuss this topic, today I'm joined by Bakhtiar Safaro, who is the founder of Central Asian Consulting in the USA, but is originally from the Gornobadakshan region of Tajikistan. Our next guest we're going to call Murad Kadirov. He's originally from Karakal, Pakistan, and we're calling him Murad on this program due to concerns for the safety of people close to him who are still in Karakal, Pakistan. And our old Medjlis friend, Steve Sperdo, a rights lawyer who has spent many years focusing on Central Asia and is currently an associate professor at the University of Southern California. Thank you all for joining me today. And uh, I want to start by looking at the situation in these two regions first, prior to the violence or, you know, and over the course of the years. So Bakhtiar, if I could start with you, could you please describe the social, social and economic situation in gorno badakhshan compared to the rest of Tajikistan? Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce and distinguished guests. It's a, it's a pleasure to come back to the program again. Majlis podcast is my favorite program that I listen every Saturday. And it's just amazing uh, to be here with all of you. Uh, again, my name is Bakhtiur Safarf and I'm a founder of Central Asia Consulting. So, yeah, in regard to, to, to economic and, and social situation in Gorna Badakhshan uh, Autonomous Oblast is uh, it's very drastic. So we can say that it's the, the region has been in blockade after after the 1992. So if you if you just compare it to the rest of the country, it's in in, in a very economically it's a it's a completely different economy, by the way, because uh, what what happened is 1992, the people from that area didn't actually or weren't allowed for different reason to work for the government. So they, they kind of they build their the own life around the, the, the different sources. So a lot of people start traveling to, to you know, different countries. And a lot of uh, population like me, we join the international community. So we, we start with international community. We kind of, and the, and the whole region, uh, like, for example, like just very simple example, like in Vanj district, we have a literally a village that, that lives in Russia. That's like they have their own community there and everybody, whoever graduates, they go to Russia. So it's kind of an, even economically, it's independent. And, and, uh, and socially, socially, of course, it's all depends on economy and socially it's also kind of connected to, to overseas. Like, you know, a lot of people right now, uh, because they actually outside of the, or outside of the Gabao, and they socially kind of also the the region is also connected to the rest of it. I would say it's more connected to outside of the Tajikistan rather to inside of Tajikistan, if if you know what I mean. So it's 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 just it just have the whole autonomy by all means at this point. So uh, uh, yeah, but but again, uh, it's difficult for for the for the autonomy to survive. But that's why. The whole remittances and all support that's coming from outside is definitely not enough. So that's why the economically and socially we can say the region is not doing that well. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Murat, um, I got the same question for you. Could you describe the social and economic situation in Karakal, Pakistan? And if anything that Bakhtiar just said sounds familiar to you, um, could you please you know, mention that the, that the situation is similar? I'm hearing him and... Uh... Yes, I would say it's similar, except the Karakal Pakistan is a sovereign republic, and as some uh, human rights or the journalists shy to say so, mostly uh, referencing it as a autonomous province of the Uzbekistan, it is not. It is sovereign uh, republic Karakal Pakistan, and social. Issues basically, it's not because the because as region it cannot sustain itself. It's we have to remember it's 40 percent of the Uzbekistan and having two million less than two million people they can 
sustain themselves very easily, uh, I would say. And basically, it's the result of, I think, on the top of the in whole, Uzbekistan is not in good shape in terms of the social situation. But the, the, actually, logically, if you common sense uh, actually says Karabakhstan should be very prospering uh, among all the uh, other regions or the the provinces of Uzbekistan, but the continuous and consistent hidden agenda of Uzbekistan to erase, suppress, suppress uh, the Karakalpak identity. When I say Karakalpak identity, I'm talking about only ethnic Karakalpaks. Uh, by the way, Kazakh people and Uzbek people in Karakalpakistan are different. They, for the generations growing up there, and they, they stand all together in the uh, against uh, that suppression okay thank you uh, i want to follow up just for a second though it, to make clear that that gona barakshan of course is is up way up in the mountains so it's it's a little bit more remote and yet karakal pakistan is is uh out in the western area in the desert of uzbekistan and you said karakal pakistan could be prosperous what is out in karakal pakistan that could make it prosperous um that is not being used it's being used, but it's being used by the uh, Uzbek government and returning nothing to the Karakalpak people. The major part of the Uzbek uh, gas sold to Russia is Kaz- uh, Karakalpak uh, gas. Besides that, all there is a lot of mineral elements and gold in there. And it's, of course, this all these facts are hidden because the inf- any information uh, is tightly controlled uh, by the Uzbek uh, authoritarian government. Okay, thank you for ex- explaining that a little bit further. Steve, I'm going to put you on the spot here a little bit and ask you, what's your understanding of the situation for activists uh, and civic movements in these two regions? They're, they're clearly distinct areas of their countries. Uh, and, and certainly they must have some grassroots kind of movements or certainly are some very influential local figures. Uh, how is that, if you can give us an idea how it, that plays out in both these areas? Well, glad to be on the spot, Bruce, and, um, and, and good to be with Bakhtiyor and Murat. You know, I'd say that, well, first of all, this is incredibly timely and it's important to look beyond, as you're doing properly, looking at the context beyond the violence that I'm sure we're going to get to in a moment. But when we look at the Pamiri community, as Bakhtiar said, it's an area that during the Soviet period had incredibly high rates of literacy. Moscow uh, was very proactive in, in making Horog, in, in a way, an attractive place to go to. And maybe it's be- by virtue of its border proximity to, you know, to, to, to the borders, the outer borders of the Soviet Union. It's, it's, it's not exactly clear to me why that is, but it's always been historically very significant that that the Pamirs were known as, on the one hand, uh, very isolated, but on the other hand, huge investments in education, which in the post-Soviet period meant that, as Bakhtiar rightly said, you had a very rich civil society, educational institutions supported by the Aga Khan Foundation, in a way, you know, somewhat of an oasis. And, you know, I'm talking now a little bit more pre-2014 here, before Tajikistan goes down uh, into a human rights crisis, which it's you know almost a decade now, it's been really abysmal. I think you can look at the Pamiri civil society activist community you were at, we were asking about, and you can see an incredibly, uh, like I said, rich intelligentsia. You had lawyers, like one of the lawyers that's now detained, um, Manucher Holik Nazarov. He headed up an organization called the Association of Pamiri Lawyers, and they did very important work. They were really at the forefront of civil society, and and in some ways they led. And, and led by example um, and helped uh, Tajik activists in other parts of Tajikistan to, to do work. So that's that's one picture, I would say, of a, of a very um, proactive and, as, as Bhaktiya was saying, insular, tight-knit, strongly, um, you know, strong community. Um, moving to Karakal, Pakistan, now that's another story. And it's, it's quite fascinating because when I was based in Bishkek about 10 years ago, I started getting to know the exiled community of Karakalpak activists. And these were people that were outside of Uzbekistan for a good reason. The reason being that President Karimov, who we know was always a hardliner, who never wanted to discuss issues of ethnic minorities, whether be they Tajiks, be they Karakalpaks, was intent 
on suppressing any discussion of autonomy, of sovereignty, as Murat has said. And so the activists that we know of uh, mostly resided in Kazakhstan, in Moscow. I mean, the political activists. In terms of uh, the, the non-political civil society, well, when you go to Nukus, as I did um, in the Mirzioyev period, you'd see that, you know, it was a very, uh, the region seems still pretty locked down tightly. When I was there in 2019, I did actually witness a modest, low-level protest by activists that were carrying Karakalpak flags. This was on the Independence Day of the Republic of Karakalpak, on December 16th. And they were very quickly, within five minutes, uh, violently uh, arrested, uh, taken off the streets. And so it's harder to speak, at least from my perspective, Murat might be able to help me out here, but it's harder to gauge the extent to which the activist community was was vibrant or if it was really mostly exiled. Um. You're right. Uh, I think that's the most like a bright indicator of what is going on. The, 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 that's actually the, the national holiday of day of constitution. What could be more like a government thing and people celebrating that get arrested? Uh, that is actually indicator how how bad is the suppression of the the Karkalpakstan identity. I'm not saying Karkalpak identity. So um, it is uh, right now. I think Karkalpak people more worried about their uh, status and their future, and um, they they tolerate a lot of issues. Uh, if we look back at the history, Karkalpak people a little different than Uzbek people who for centuries were settled and were under the hardship and they kind of uh, had that uh, style of life under a bigger authority and thing. But Karkalpak people are free spirits. They were nomad people and all their uh, relationship with the other uh, groups were based on the on the negotiation, and they they I would say more democratic spirits are here. That's why actually unexpected raise of people uh, when with the government tried ironically ironically uh, Article 70 of the Constitution were the existing existing Article states actually sovereignty of Republic Karakal Pakistan is protected by Republic Uzbekistan and by using that article they actually trying to encroach impinge the, the sovereignty of the Republic Karakal Pakistan oh, you know and that, I'm gonna to go to Bakhti in a minute too uh, in just a second but I want to ask you Murad real quickly understanding that that this is a sovereign republic at least according constitutionally Karakal Pakistan's a sovereign republic what's the feeling of of all the people inside the Karakal Pak Karakal Pakistan sovereign republic then um, you mentioned that there was other there's a lot of Uzbeks there there's Kazakhs and there's other people do do all those other groups identify with being part of the Karakal Pakistan republic uh, or or is it more that the ethnic Karakal Pakistan uh, see this uh, or feel this strong more strongly. Uh, yes, they do. Actually, uh, I think they do because uh, when, when in school we were uh, uh, we were in Karakalpak school, and in Karakalpak school we had the Uzbek pupil who went to the Karakalpak classes despite having Uzbek classes available to them in the same school. Uh, I grew up and uh, we we never knew the difference between these people and uh, recently suddenly the it started doing like a Karakalpak, Uzbek, Kazakh, uh, Karakalpaks are a minority and I think I think even they they uh, I think they stand stand with, uh, as all Karakalpak people for their sovereignty. Okay, uh, and Bakhtiar, I want it's the situation in Gono is a little bit different. The people are distinct, certainly, um, but there was I've never seen or heard anyway uh, that there was any movement to be independent from Tajikistan or that people wanted anything more than the autonomous status that the region had. Is that true, or do you have a different understanding? Yeah, I actually never heard of uh, anybody saying that they want to be independent. And yes, the or Gorno Badakhshan autonomy is very specific and the region is specific. We have uh, even in this in this area, we have 
several languages that being spoken. I mean, dialects. We have, you know, Tajik speak, people speak Tajik. We speak, have people speak Shugnan. We have Vakhan language. We have Kyrgyz language. And uh, all, all this region is diverse. We also have uh, people that, who, you know, have uh, Shia Muslims. We have Sunni Muslims. And we actually have a small people who are, you, you know, Christianity now. And they do with the missions in Horog and, and, and they live there. So uh, these are the recent trends that we see. So it's very multicultural. And, uh, and like I said, in these 30 years, people, uh, because we actually were forced to leave Tajikistan during the civil war because of our independent views. So we, we kind of, you know, were, were segregated in this area for the last 30 years. And people understood. It's like, yeah, look, they, 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 they have their own way and the people build their own lives. So now they come after so many years, people build their own life. They don't actually talk about politics not so much. They build their own life. And now they're going to come every time and uh, literally want to ban people. But the people already kind of get used to it. It's, it's been 30 years. We have a new generation of people who grew up freely. I mean, you can't ban those people. It's just, it just, it's not going to work. That's what this t- government is like. You let the, your kid go and you're not asking about him, what he's doing, how he's surviving. And then after 30 years, hey, uh, you want, I want you to come back. It doesn't work that way. You know, you have to, they, they didn't do anything to bring the government to, to, to people of, of, of Badakhshan close to, to the center. They, did, they didn't do anything. They didn't try. They were busy with, with, the, with, the, you know, with their own problems to make themselves rich. The corruptions, you know, the change in constitutions, not having a free and fair elections. And that the people build their own lives. So this is this is a little different than what's happening in Karakalpakistan, I would say. Oh, you know, I'm just going to ask before we have the halftime break here, Murad, if you could just comment a little bit on that too. What kind of what kind of government attention has Karakalpakistan Karakalpa seen in the last 30 years since independence? I mean, is there is there a lot of government influence out there? Very little. Uh, how how is it working out there? If you're talking about the Karakalpak government, it's basically uh, people don't have real representation in the in the uh, it's called their parliament uh, the, our parliament is the johara kines and they, they don't have real representation because of the all the election and elected people are tightly controlled by the uzbekistan uh, they have to be very uh, conformists whatever they do the, the you can see that from the uh, blame of uh, the officials saying that initiative to strip off the sovereignty comes from the from the deputies of the Ali Majlis. Actually, uh, the human right, the lawyer, human right defender, Dolit Murat Tajumratov, actually uh, discovered that they were they've been forced to 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 enter that that suggest, suggestion. So. Um, that is one of the main problems uh, of the Karakalpak people that say they don't have sovereignty in terms of the representation of their people and for self self determination. We uh, we we can see the sentiments on the some some even uh, the analysts and journalists saying that uh, well uh, it's so small uh, people small country. Uh, how much how much sovereignty they have and think we need to call the things by their names it is sovereign republic and we have to make the excuse back uh, in the days uh, when soviet union fall uh, fell uh, if you remember in 1990s 91 uh, republic karpakistan was they declared their sovereignty and they stayed about three years, really sovereign, I would say. Uh, and in 1993, uh, Karimov started taking over Karakalpakistan, and they came. There was the big uh, forum uh, in the Birdah Theater, and all the intelligence. Speaking of the intelligence, the, there were a lot of intelligence, a lot of progressive people, uh, educated people, and uh, they. It was uh, the long day for President Karimov. At one point, the negotiations stalled 
and he even went to the airport to go back and he came back and nobody talks about that thing uh, there was the big discussion of the uh, sovereignty of Republic of Pakistan, option A and option B being the one of them uh, really sovereign different republic and uh, Karim of coming and asking to join that and Karkopak people didn't want to join. That's why he entered the 20 years of contract. After 20 years, you will do your referendum and you can uh, go separate. That was trick uh, the U government used that time. You know, and then let me on that note mention that, that Steve just a, a few minutes ago said that, that he had started to run into these activists that came from Karakal, Pakistan about 10 years ago, which, uh, if we look back, is, is pretty much the eve of when they were supposed to have this referendum on independence and never did. Um, so I'm gonna, we need to move along a little bit and go to the second half of the show where we're going to discuss what just happened in Gonobarakshan and, and in Karakal, Pakistan. Uh, but uh, first, let me recap real quick. I'm Bruce Panier, the host of the Medjlis podcast, and we're discussing the recent violence in Tajikistan's Gonobarakshan Autonomous Oblast and in the uh, Karakal, Pakistan Republic in Uzbekistan. Uh, today's guests are Steve Sverdlov, rights lawyer with long experience in Central Asia, who's currently teaching at the University of Southern California, Bakhtiar Safarov, uh, who's originally from Gornobarakshan area, and Murat Kadirov, who is originally from Karakal, Pakistan. And uh, uh, we're moving on now to, to what just happened. And I will, you know, I, I, I want to let Steve get in a little bit and um, in here and, and talk about the fallout, what you heard, and then I'll, I'll ask Bakhtiar about Gorno Badakhshan. But Steve, if you could explain what you heard about how the Gorno Badakhshan problem started and starting, let's go back to either last November or, or May, uh, and then we'll get Bakhtiar, and then I'll ask you to comment on Karakal Pakistan, and we'll ask Murad about that too. St start with Gorno Badakhshan or start with Karakal Pakistan? Uh, Gorno Badakhshan, please. Well, in Gorno Badakhshan, you know, we had a murder that the, the local population was demanding an investigation into. We had a number of things that contributed to this, but essentially the, the central authorities' unwillingness to listen to local demands to investigate, by all accounts, was was a crime, uh, and led to further mobilization, protests, or organized protests, peaceful protests, and very reasonable demands coming from Pamiri civil society. There was also the removal of the governor. There were a lot of things that contributed to this, but uh, as of May, another attempt at protest was essentially put down by very violent force. And at this point, Bakhtiar will have the count better than I do, but we're talking about uh, upwards of perhaps north of 50, is that right, Bakhtiar, people already killed? Yes, um, like 28, but uh, I'm confirmed they're saying more. So we, that's the thing we don't, we don't know yet because of the, we don't have a third party independent investigation. Correct. And as we as we are sitting here today, I've tried to compile a list of the activists that have been detained, in addition to the, the disproportionate force, Bruce, that was used on the protesters. And of course, there's still been no independent investigation from the UN or groups like Amnesty or Human Rights Watch. But just to give you a sense of how uh, devastating the wave of arrests of activists and journalists has been, um, as of this day, um, we have, for example, two journalists who were part of the Commission 44, which was a, a legal organization set up to transmit the demands of the population to the government, which was really supposed to be a dialogue between the authorities and the people. So the two journalists who were part of the commission, Ikhtihor Saibekov Muyasar Sadon Shoyev, both sentenced to 10 and 11 years. Then two other activists, um, part of this Commission 44, uh, Hujamri Pernazarov, Shaftulo Bektavlatov, given 18 years. And then beyond those convictions, as you've discussed on a few previous programs, you have these leading civil society activists like Manucher Holik Nazarov, he's detained. Uh, the lawyer, Farmuz, Faramuz Irgashev, who uh, launched an ill-fated attempt to run for president. Uh, against Rahman, also detained, and he's one of the only lawyers that would be available to even represent these people in detention. And then, of course, uh, going back to the very start of this, as uh, the journalist Ulfat Khonim uh, Mamad Shoyeva, and her arrest was accompanied by uh, a lot of claims from the Tajik authorities that the United States and maybe other Western powers 
were instigating the unrest. And, and so really it's been, uh, in addition to that, let me just say the journalist Anora uh, Salkorva, who a lot of people know, brother, her mother, detained and questioned because of the work she's doing uh, from Prague to illuminate and illustrate the crackdown and, and a lot of others that I'm not mentioning here. So it's just been absolutely a devastating crackdown on what is left of, of, of civil society in Gorna Badakhshan. Okay, you know, and Bakhtiar, could you fill us in too? I mean, since the, since the uh, security operation, which the government later called an anti-terrorist operation, since it started, and now that it's, it's at least the, the shooting part of it is over, what, what is Gorno Badakhshan like today? I mean, what's happening out there? Uh, yeah, yeah. So basically what's happening, we, we don't have that much information as, as we used to have. So every time I now I call to friends and say, look, they don't want to talk. They, they just we have limited information. So I would say the flow of information, the communication has stopped. So, I mean, it's we have we get very limited information. And uh, on top of it, we actually now witnessing a lot of like we sort of, you know, people that weren't even related. So we get we see a lot of things that the business now, 11 businessmen were, were, were detained. They, they charging him with a connection to, to you know, uh, supporting financially the, the protesters. So we get, we get a lot of reports uh, from the ground like that. So, and the people, uh, and also uh, more and more and more people for some reason are very desperate and want to leave, uh, it, which is very, very, you know, it's normal, but when the since people were were mo- living living a lot, and uh, you asked me about the social the social aspects of of Gobao, and if you look at the you know last census, the population is around three hundred thousand. It used to be the same be, when the census was done before. So that means that that the outflow from from the of the population was even even you know it was it was. A lot, but now it's get. It's probably we're expecting there's going to be more people that are going to be be leaving the area. Uh, we do, we do, we do still wait, and we got just today a resolution from European Commission that they're asking for independent investigation. So I think this investigation is very critical at this point because we actually need a third party who can go and investigate and can come up with a report. So there is. There is certainly the diaspora outside of the outside the the the, the country are uh, now working on this to make sure that the whole recommendation that's coming from the this resolutions implemented. So I think that's 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 pretty much happening. What what that's what's happening right now. Okay, thank you, Bakhtiar. Um, Steve, let's go back to you for a second, and can you uh, tell us a little bit about? the lead into to the violence in Karakal, Pakistan, and what you've been hearing has happened since uh, July 1st when the security forces actually started opening fire on protesters. Right. Well, a couple of days prior to July 1st, the government announced that these amendments would be, or, or you should say, we should say deletions or removals of language uh, would appear in the new constitution, the, the constitution that the government is set to, to, to roll out essentially uh, replacing the old constitution and zeroing out, zeroing out we should say, uh, President Mirzoyev's term, allowing him to run again. And this language, uh, as Murad said, would strip Karakal Pakistan of its autonomy, of its, of its sovereignty. And this immediately touched a nerve among the population. People like Daulet Murat, Taji Murat, of an activist, a lawyer and journalist, and, and, and journalists like Lola Gul, Kali Khanaba, started commenting on this. And, and by all means, by all accounts, these were peaceful calls for discussion, uh, calls for peaceful meetings. And as of July 1st, we see a mass, I'm talking thousands of people amassing in the streets of Nukus, and then um, some movement from other cities like Kungrad uh, towards Nukus, and, 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 and a lot of people calling attention to the fact that this language totally violated the, the, the agreement and the rights that the Karakal Pakistan Republic had. And then the questions begin. Now we're seeing, as of today, uh, the government is really emphasizing that they believe that violent protesters were led by some foreign or external forces and that protesters started attacking uh, law enforcement personnel. Of course, that's hotly disputed and, and will need an international 
investigation to determine exactly what happened. Of course, we, we don't know that's true by all accounts. So we know from experience that in Central Asia, a lot of law enforcement personnel use disproportionate and excessive force to disperse protesters. And, and there's still a lot of questions about what weapons, what riot dispersing weapons were used. But as you all saw, we saw emerge on social media, countless bloody and gory videos of people with deep cavity wounds. And uh, some, again, some videos hotly disputed on both sides. And now luckily we've got, you know, one or two foreign correspondents, AFP and Eurasianet, Joanna Lillis on the ground in Nukus, but we're still awaiting more information about how the protesters were actually dispersed, um, how the use of force was used on July 1st, July 2nd. And right now there's a sort of uneasy calm and uh, certainly uh, we're starting to see a lot of sort of the rollout of a propaganda campaign by, by the government to emphasize that this was all coordinated from abroad and that these were violent protesters. And interestingly, Kun Uz, which has a reputation for being the most independent of Uzbek media outlets today, they put out a report, but that report notably begins with the eyewitness testimony of police officers in Nukus who say that the protesters were violent, that they attacked them, surrounded them, had weapons, that they were coordinated. And so, you know, again, it's, it's, it, it's all a little bit hazy and we're waiting for more, more clarity on all of this. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, and Murad, over to you. I know that I know that you haven't been there um, in a while, but uh, I also know that um, it's difficult to get information out of there, and it's probably hard for you to keep in contact with anybody you know. But certainly, no one is following what's happened there more closely than you are. Um, can you give us an idea of what of what people were saying the last time you were able to get in touch with them, and and also what what you see on uh, and read. And, and what you think is uh, significant about the reporting that's going on about Karakal Pakistan now? What's significant about the reporting in Karakal Pakistan? It's absence, actually. Uh, there is no much. Uh, I was very pleased to hear from Steve that at least two journalists are in there. The, what, what we are hearing from our people, uh, it's actually, first of all, there are can't be any talks about uh, violent gun protests in there because their guns are non-existent in the hands of the people there. Even shotguns are for decades collected from the people imposing very harsh laws to keep them. I know uh, my friends all voluntarily surrendered their guns rather than dealing with these laws. So there is no gun uh, in the violence. There actually, if you look and see the events just before that, uh, leader Dolit Murat Tajimratov was calling for the very disciplined, uh, lawful protest. An interesting fact there is actually Dolit Murat Tajimratov was able to pull permission to make like peaceful demonstration in July 5th, which is unthinkable in the in the given situation, which shows, I think, that uh, Karakalpa government actually is sympathetic to these people. They can just cannot do anything. And besides that, we, we, uh, what we have uh, from the information, what we have uh, June 28th, actually, all the guns from the law enforcement within Karakal Pakistan was collected and locked up. And uh, when this protest started, actually, all law enforcement of Karakal Pak people are collected in one place and kept there. Uh, so uh, thank you, Steve, for uh, voicing the concerns about the activists like uh, Dolit Mataj Muratov and Lala Gul Khan, uh, and uh, th we don't really have information about that. What we hear is Dolit Mataj Muratov was in critical situation, critical condition in the ICU, and now we hear that something happened with his mind and some possibly he was... Uh, affected by the psychotropic uh, substance or sub the treatment and he is doesn't he doesn't sound like in his mind now and we don't have any information about whereabouts Lalagul Kalhanova. 
Um, and and right. uh, you brought up another an interesting point. And I want to make sure this is clear for our audience too. You you know you said that uh, Taji Muratov had actually gone to the city to the administration and said he wanted to hold a protest. So he was looking to hold a, a legal protest. Correct. He was able to. He was able to pull that permission to do the peaceful demonst- uh, the protest demonstrations at the front of uh, the government building, and they give that permission, and right away he's been arrested from home. But people hearing that he was arrested, they started protesting against that, and he's been released by Karkalpak uh, law enforcement. And after a few hours, actually, special forces from Uzbekistan came and beaten up uh, all whole family, killed few people who was protecting him uh, so, uh, the, around his house and taken him. And uh, by the information we have, he was taking it first to the Khorezm uh, region and he kept we heard uh, uh, when he came out, there is the videos he's saying, I need to have a couple hours rest and I will uh, come back. They, they uh, if you translate what he said, in terms of they cheered me up, they cheered me up and they were uh, hitting me on my uh, heart area. And when he went home that night around after 3 a.m., He's been taken by uh, Uzbek uh, special forces. Uh, Bakhtiar, I still want to stay with this because um, to show that they were at least trying to be legitimate protests here, the protesters in May in, in Harog, before the protest, they also went to the authorities and asked them to, for permission to hold a protest or at least told them they were going to hold one. Is that correct? Yes, yes. They they did ask for permission, so they didn't let them. It's and uh, first, uh, if you remember, on, on May fourteenth, uh, they uh, they actually gathered in uh, in Barhoro, where the the late Mamad Bokir Mamad Bokirov's house for 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 you know for discussions and getting the permits. They didn't let them, and they just gave them you know two days, and then. Um, on May 16th, they were trying to go to peacefully to the central Ismaili, the Somoni Square, but they were stopped and uh, one people got shot and that, uh, you know, everything. And after that, they asked for more troops and more troops came in from from Tajik, from from capital city. And, you know, about the Rushon massacre, what happened? Uh, because people didn't want this uh, group, uh, this uh, military convoy to go to Horo, and that's how that's uh, that's what what they did. They they actually killed a lot of protesters, and we don't know exactly how many people were killed there, and a lot of atrocities. They called we, we called the Rushon massacre. What happened after that? And then um, after a couple more couple more weeks, they they killed uh, uh, you know Mahmoud Bokir and they. Detain other leader, leaders, and it's it's been going on since then. And uh, and if you think about it, and uh, there was no reason actually to to have this crackdown because you know government has its officials over there. They control all the routes. They control all borders. They all control all you know real economy. The whole uh, mineral reserves that they have. They have a couple of. Uh, you know, uh, marble and other type of businesses they they family is is doing. There was no reason actually to to be so harsh on the people. But uh, again, you know, they removed the governor, and then uh, if you remember before that, there were a lot of talks about this uh, Chinese military bases. Uh, that uh, now we don't hear anything about this because you nobody nobody talks about them. Anymore, so I think there was a pre-plan to suppress this civil society, so nobody talks about this security program that they have, and uh, they keep asking for security assistance. All countries they have security cooperation with China, they have security cooperation with Russia, United States, and Europe, but uh, but you know they don't want to deal with the with the cause of the security. Security they create the whole chaos. And uh, they want to ask for security. I mean, uh, I think from my point of view, U.S. and Europe and other countries are just wasting the money money on the security programs that they have. So, uh, uh, and it just 
there was no reason, like even even in compared to Karakal, Karakal, Pakistan, and whole region is uh, just was recovering from COVID, and now Ukraine and Ukraine and Russia war situation, and everybody knows about the economic consequences, and especially now with Taliban rising in Afghanistan, there was no reason to actually start this uh, special operation. But again, you know, we see that uh, other bigger uh, events inspired those people to to act uh, the way they act now. You know, I want to I want to stick with you for just a second here. And we got to wrap this up real quick. Uh, but but I, I want this calls for your opinion. How much damage has been done between the region's relationship with the government? Uh, you know, is it are we is this like a, a watershed moment and we're never is, do you see any way that they can reconcile after all this has happened? No, that's in, in Gabao situation. There is a, there's a watershed. There is no no way that uh, people are going to go back unless those people who committed uh, those crimes, the law enforcement who will be brought to justice and all political prisoners will be released and uh, the whole, you know, compensations that will be paid for the families, which I don't think they're going to do. But uh, I w- I don't see I don't see the government showing the goodwill and uh, following all those uh, you know people's demands and now we have European Commission resolutions so we'll see if, I don't believe they're gonna follow until all these uh, resolutions and all people's demand are met there is no there is no turning turning back on this situation it's gonna get actually worse I think. Uh, Murad, same question, and I'll get to you in just a second, Steve. Murad, same same question to you. After what just happened, do you do you see any reconciliation possible between the Karakal Pakistan Republic and the Uzbek authorities? I mean, is, is have we reached a point where things can never be the same between the two? In general, it's Karakalpak people and Uzbek people is never uh, ethnically never uh, conflict, uh, at least in latest history. Uh, so. I, I want to warn to not to make this ethnic violence and if Uzbek government recognizes the sovereignty in not only on paper and will start according to constitution start relationship between two republics on contractual base on negotiation base and Karakalpak people start will be able to elect real representative of their people, I think it could move forward provided all the uh, human rights violations are investigated and giving right conclusion about it. And Steve, certainly to your comment, but I also wondered if possible, could you comment on what, what the governments need to do uh, to try to reconcile the situation there, and and also what outside forces, international organizations, or individual countries might be able to do to try to uh, it's, it certainly to help, help heal the wounds, but also try to prevent this something like this from happening again. Yeah, no, I mean these are moments that define these regimes, and just uh, comparing and contrasting Mirzoev and Rahmon here, I found it interesting that uh, Rahmon was a little bit more open, you could say. He came out in a speech and said, yes, I gave the order. I, I Essentially, I ordered them to shoot to kill. I had to do it. And in a way, it was unapologetic about the use of force, which you know is, is problematic, but at least it was honest. And I think you know, Bakhtiora rightly mentions that without more international pressure, there's been a very, very muted to almost non-existent response coming from partners like the United States. Without pressure there. And it's good to see the European Parliament come in with this resolution just yesterday. I don't think we're going to see much of an improvement. And 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 I don't think this problem is, is going to go away for Tajikistan. It's, you know, in, interestingly that 30 years ago, you know, who thought, right, we were all saying, who thought that the Soviet Union would be brought down by conflicts like Nagorno-Karabakh, and who predicted that Abkhazia and South Ossetia and Transnistria would become such existential questions? And it's sort of the same here, in a way, if you look at this process uh, as unfolding, an unfolding collapse of the Soviet space, these autonomous provinces both provoke existential crises. In in the case of Uzbekistan, uh, President Mirzoyev has in a way, been more nuanced. He said in in remarks on July 
6th, I believe it was, that excessive force was used in some cases and that if it was found to, to have been used by law enforcement personnel, then those people should be punished. Of course, that's good. But on the other hand, he's emphasized already this narrative of foreign provocateurs without mentioning who that foreign government is. Is it Kazakhstan? Is it, is it Moscow? And I think, as I've said, that really muddies the water and it worries me because it, again, it harkens back to the way Karim have handled the Andijan massacre. And so I think um, as to your, your core question about what should be done now, I think recognizing that issues of ethnic minorities, of autonomy, of decentralization versus the capital are obviously salient. And, and you know, Kazakhstan also in January this year showed us that as well, that, you know, it's Western Kazakhstan, the far, most far flung region that provoked this crisis. I think what that shows us is that A, Central Asia is in need of a lot of attention from international partners. Uh, B, that we need human rights organizations more than ever allowed to do their job, um, including journalists. And, and the only way we get that, the only way we get that, I think, is if the European Union and the United States government and other partners that have money to spend are willing to make those conditions for their engagement. We, I think without that, we're going to continue to see socioeconomic issues bubbling to the surface and causing responses from the law enforcement and, and, and the state, which, are, which, which involve disproportionate and excessive uses of force, which, which involves a loss of life. And, and I, of course, I agree with Murat that there's no long history of ethnic strife between ethnic Uzbeks and ethnic Karakalpaks, but it is worrying, it is troubling that in the heat of the moment, you know, we see a lot of bloggers, uh, pro-government bloggers in Uzbekistan sort of raising very chauvinistic and nationalistic points. I think that, that I think we need to ignore those voices and we need to have some sober discussions and really open conversations and open dialogue. I'd like to see the parliament in Uzbekistan hold hearings. I'd like to see TV shows. I, of course, I'd like to say this, see the same thing in Tajikistan. But there, the situation is, is so abysmal with human rights that it's going to require, I think, more of an external response, a stronger one. So both require international attention. And I, and I think what you're doing, Bruce, by monitoring the situation is extremely important. Thank you. Um, you know, and, and I know we really are, should be out of time, but I'm going to give everyone like two minutes to, to make a last comment if they want to, because this is a really important topic and it's a really deep talk, a topic. And clearly, I can't ask all the questions that probably should be asked. Uh, on a program like this. So, um, Murad, I'm going to start out with you. Is there something important that, that we've missed in this conversation that you think needs to be said about the, what happened in Karakal, Pakistan? Uh, I agree with Steve about uh, not let this uh, make it. Actually, these sentiments about the, the, the ethnic uh, standing off to, to these things uh, plays to the, the, the president's new election, new uh, changes to constitution uh, in hand actually, and uh, the having inter uh, the outside influence to the events doesn't hold water. I think it's like a, the president tried to change these articles, and how 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 that possible uh, outside forces hypnotized hypnotized him and make them change these articles. I don't understand that outside influence. Them. Yes, there were uh, Karakal Parks and international NGOs uh, from Kazakhstan, from Russia, uh, supporting uh, Karakal Park people, people, but I don't think there was the state influence from the outside. Thank you. Steve, what, uh, what, did I, what important needs to be said that hasn't been said so far in this, in this show? Well, first of all, you know, in it, when killing of this scale occurs, I want to express my condolences. Um, I don't know the names of the 18 victims killed in Karakal, Pakistan, and I don't know all the names of the victims in, in, in Gorna Badakhshan, but I think we need to remember those people. We need to mourn them. We need to, we need to write their histories and their stories and tell their stories. Number two, I'm thinking about the fate of those detained in both of these provinces is really, really important to keep in mind and keep at the top of the agenda that in, in cases where governments want to showcase that their behavior didn't violate human rights, they like to have show trials. They like to have false testimony. They like to force people to say something that didn't actually occur. And, and so I think the risk of torture has to be at the top of the agenda. Uh, and, and then finally, I guess I'd say that recommendations for going forward, I think Tajikistan is far past the point 
where there should be a soft engagement or soft power. I think there uh, we've seen such a wide spectrum of, of, violent, of violence and of human rights violations that we've long needed to have a more robust response, including sanctions directed at the government for what has happened. And it does you know, really acquire some existential characteristics for the people of the Pamirs, an ethnic minority that has really been targeted in a way that we, we just don't often uh, think about. So, so I think there has to be a very tough response on Tajikistan. When it comes to Uzbekistan, the door in a way is still open. The jury is still out. The government at least is saying that they're going to allow international observers. But um, we have seen that several have had trouble um, getting in. And so it's, it's, a, it's, it's really important days get in Uzbekistan. So I hope that we can return to this topic and uh, again, make sure the due process is followed for all of these trials and investigations that are about to take place. Okay, thank you very much. And, and Bakhtiar, I guess that you, you, I'll give you the last word on this one too. What, what haven't we said during this show, uh, during the program that's important that you think it needs to be said? Here's your opportunity. This is, this is the very important thing to, to mention is uh, this all turmoil that happening right now in both Karakal, Pakistan and Kazakhstan and the Central Asia region. That's the thing that all experts, uh, people who know the region have been telling this government to do. So, but, but instead of, you know, listening to these experts, you know, local and international experts, everything was ignored. All those experts were, you know, local experts jailed or disappeared. International experts, you know, like people like you have been, you know, always vocal about this. But it's not it's not happening. You know, we don't see any. It's actually getting worse uh, rather than getting better. I think now it's a time to to, you know, the people who especially international experts have to make sure that the, all the resolutions then and then policy documents that coming from uh, from 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 the European government and US and other Western countries so that will be implemented so we have to have a sort sort of action plan for 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 those documents that they come and and uh, you know like the and and implement those you know recommendation especially with with investigating both in Karakal Pakistan and in Gabao so we would know what what really happened and based on this uh, have the all strategic documents that uh, you know was developed recently in Central Asia and in United States thank you very much Bakhtiar and thank you to all our guests on this program uh, I could go on with this for hours and hours but we do have to wrap this up it is supposed to be a podcast uh, that people can listen to very quickly while they're doing whatever they're doing. So uh, thanks to my guests, uh, we have Murad, who's originally from Karakal, Pakistan. We have Bakhtiar Safara, who's originally from Gorno-Badakhshan. And of course, Steve Sverdlov, who is uh, well known to anyone who follows Central Asia, a uh, veteran of the area and someone one of the leading rights defenders uh, for all the peoples of Central Asia. Thank you very much for being on the program. And a big thank you also to Nathan Shoemaker, our Medjelis podcast producer in Washington, D.C., and a reminder, you can subscribe to the Medjelis podcast or the Central Asia and Focus newsletter by visiting RFARL's website at rfarl.org. I'm Bruce Paneer. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll be back next week. Bye-bye.